Welcome. The Egyptians of ancient times were very practical people, and they're very practical in the mathematics. So what I want to talk about now is Egyptian fractions and uh, how they approach them, how they approach fractions in general. So let's start with a very practical problem. Suppose we have, say, seven pies, and we'd like to share them among 12 boys. Now we would say, okay, just give every boy seven torts of a pie, maybe chop each pie into 12 bits and give each person seven pieces. Um, the Egyptians wanted a little bit better than that. They actually asked themselves, okay, what's the best thing we do? Could we give every boy an entire pie? Well, no, there's not enough pies there. Can we do the next best thing? Maybe half a pie for each boy. And we can certainly do that. So let's uh, pull off seven halves. One, two, three, four, five, six, oops, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Sorry, I meant twelve halves. There's twelve halves. We can certainly give each boy a whole chunk of pie as big as a half. There's at least one pie left over. What could we do with that? We still want to share that amongst the 12 boys. I guess now the obvious thing is to just divide that into 12, which I think I've just failed to do because I can't do fractions apparently. And basically we're going to say, give every child half a pie and one twelfth of a pie. They say that's better than giving small little pieces of seven twelfths. Give them as best they can. It's a nice practical result, plus the best next best thing you can do, which is one twelfth. So today we call any fraction that's written as a sum of fractions of this form, namely with numerators of one, an Egyptian fraction. And the Egyptians actually had special notation for reciprocals of numbers. They placed a dot on top of their uh, symbols for the numbers themselves. Of course, they weren't using these Hindu-Arabic numerals here. All right, so the Egyptians would say, okay, if I wanted to say three-tenths, they wouldn't write one-tenth plus one-tenth plus one-tenth because that's not as practical in the sense of giving people the biggest pieces possible. They say three-tenths is actually a quarter of the pie for each person plus a twentieth of a pie. So they actually had the added rule that they wanted each fraction of the numerator of one and they wanted all the fractions to be distinct coming from taking the largest pieces they can hand out. And it's actually a bit tricky finding these things. Five-sevenths, for example, is a, a half plus a fifth plus a seventieth. And they're actually not unique. I bet, a little exercise for you, you could actually create a different way of breaking five-sevenths as a sum of distinct unit fractions. And this little exercise, go for it. So what I'd like to do now is go to a question that actually Fibonacci asked some 2,000 years later in 1200. Does every number actually admit an Egyptian fraction expression? Can you actually do this for each fraction? Now, the Egyptians didn't seem to question this. They had tables and tables of values of how to write each number as Egyptian, some of Egyptian fractions. But whether it can be done for every single fraction is actually worth asking. Fibonacci appears as one of the first people to actually ask this, and more important, answer it. So Fibonacci said yes to the affirmative. He managed to figure out a way to prove that every fraction can indeed be written as a sum of Egyptian fractions. And it's called, today called Fibonacci's greedy algorithm. And I'll explain why the word greedy is appropriate in just a second. Um, let me illustrate with an example. Suppose you wish to write 4 thirteenths as an Egyptian fraction. Now, the first thing you ask is, what's the biggest amount of pie you can give each child? So we've got 13 kids and 4 pies. And the way I personally ask that question, I can divide the numerator and denominator each by four. So four divided by four is one, 13 divided by four is three and a quarter. That tells me, this is just bigger than three, that one third of the pie is too big. I can't give each kid one third of the pie. The next best thing I do is give each kid a quarter of the pie. So I'm gonna take what I have, four thirteenths, and see what giving a quarter of the pie out leaves me. Uh, okay, so that's going to be 16 50 tooths for the first one, and the other one's going to be 13 50 tooths. That leaves me 3 50 tooths of pi remaining. Uh, three, a division problem of sharing three pies amongst 50 kids. We will now attack the same problem the same way. 3 50 tooths, bad handwriting, divide top and bottom by 3, 1 and 17 and a third. Uh, this tells me. 1 17th is bigger than 3 52ths. So the best thing to do is work with 1 18th. That's the next best choice. So let's look at 3 52ths and I'll subtract from 1 18th. Seems a very mysterious algorithm. Um, cross multiplying, getting common denominator and all that. That's 54 over 52 times 18. I don't know what that is. Minus 52 over 52 over 18. That gives me 2 over 52 18. I can simplify that a little bit. It's 1 over 52 times 9. Uh, it's basically 520 minus 52. I think that's 1 4 68th. And I think we're there. I can piece this all together and now have that 4 thirteenths is, I was managed to be able to take for a quarter. That left me a result, which I could then rewrite as taking off an 18th. There's the 18th. Do, do, do. But what that left me behind taking off an 18th is 1 4 68th. 
There it is, 4 thirteenths as an Egyptian fraction. So Fibonacci realized if you take this process of always removing the largest fraction you possibly fraction with the largest denominator you possibly can, um, you will always end up results with smaller numerator. For example, we started with the numerator 4, we took off the largest fraction we could, and we left with the numerator 3. From 3 32ths, numerator of 3, we took off the largest fraction we could, 1 18th, and we left with a numerator of 2, um, which actually, so I'm just reducing here, left us a remainder of 1. So you get a remainder of 1, that means we can repiece everything together again and write as a, as a sum of fractions with numerators 1, that is an Egyptian fraction. So here goes, let me now prove that Fibonacci's method is always going to work. So let me just do this abstractly now. So the claim is, let's choose a green pen this time. If I'm given a fraction A over B, my job is to choose a fraction 1 nth with n as large as possible, so that 1 nth is still smaller than A over B, but if I went with 1 over n minus 1, it wouldn't work, it'd be bigger than what I can do. So then we're going to subtract from this 1 nth, and the claim is this will produce a fraction with even smaller numerator. All right, well, let's work out this fraction on the left. Let's uh, common denominator of bn, so that'd be a times n over bn minus b over bn. So we've got to check two things. That this numerator is, well, first of all, it better be positive, because if I start going to the negative numbers, I'm in trouble. So we should check it's positive, and we should also check that it's smaller than what we started with. That is smaller than the numerator a. All right, two things to go through. Well, the thing is, Look how we chose this value n. Let's unravel this first inequality. This is telling me that b is less than a n, which I could say is that uh, a n minus b is bigger than zero. Bingo, exactly what I wanted. It is, we're still in the positives. If I unravel the second inequality, it's telling me that b is bigger than a n minus n. That is, a n minus n, uh, sorry, a n minus b, do, 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 do. Oh, I was saying it's not one, that's an A. Gosh, you can see I'm very human. I can't even do basic algebra. This is telling me that A n minus B is actually less than A, just as he wanted. So there we go. Fibonacci did this algebra essentially, managed to prove that if you take off the largest value of and you can as a denominator of a unit fraction, you're left with another fraction with a smaller denominator. Repeat the process, you'll be left with a smaller denominator again. Repeat the process, smaller denominator again. As we're staying in the integers and always staying positive, we must eventually end up with a denominator of 1, in which case we can piece it all back together again and end up with an Egyptian fraction expression for the original fraction. So there it is. And you see why it's called the greedy algorithm now, because what you're doing is taking off the largest fraction you possibly can. You're being very greedy which is exactly what the, the Egyptians were doing in the first place. It's a very practical answer to their problems. All right. Thanks very much.